uh, today I'm here to uh, share some of my feelings about uh, some key research and trials that came out of ASCO 2020, the first virtual meeting of its kind. And as I do every year with eCancer, today I'm just uh, going to bring you a roundup of uh, the key take home message uh, from this uh, ASCO meeting. First, let me discuss a couple of uh, high profile trials, the, the trials that led to biggest uh, debate on social media uh, and the trials that uh, are a little controversial about whether or not they are practicing thing and what my take is on those trials. Uh, let's start with the uh, one of the plenary trials uh, called the Adora trial of uh, adjuvant osimertinib versus placebo uh, in EGFR mutation positive non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, so this was a trial in which uh, they tested adjuvant osimertinib for three years versus placebo and found that uh, adjuvant osimertinib significantly improved disease-free survival with a quite impressive hazard ratio of 0.17. Now, if you take it into face value, this seems like this is this should be a practice ending trial. This looks like a very important trial. You, never, you, you very rarely see a hazard ratio of 0.17 and especially in lung cancer. Uh, but if we look into details of that trial, then there are a couple of things that uh, are of concern. Uh, first, the control arm trials, uh, the, the control arm uh, patients did not necessarily get chemo. So getting chemo was not mandated. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think more than half of the patients did not get chemo in the control arm, which is not the standard of care. The standard of care for patients who have undergone surgery for uh, non-small cell lung cancer, stage one to stage three, is to get adjuvant chemo. Now, how could some patients in the control arm not get adjuvant chemo? Uh, I, I, I will never be able to understand that. That's not the standard of care. And so if we, this is a trial that is not comparing against the standard of care, it is comparing against placebo. Some of the patients might have gotten chemo, but some of the patients are not getting chemo. So the control arm, is not the ideal control arm. And I can't really, can't imagine patients who have underwent surgery for lung cancer, not getting anything at all and just getting placebo uh, because they are the part of this trial. A and B, the overall survival data are not mature and the overall survival, whatever data we have at this moment does not show that. Uh, it shows uh, very parallel running OAS graphs, the couple of graphs. Now, without having overall survival data, I think it's uh, difficult to recommend any adjuvant treatment for, for, for any disease setting. It's not only about lung cancer, because the bar for giving an adjuvant therapy is much higher than the bar for giving any treatment in, in the advanced setting. In the adjuvant therapy, because a number of patients will have already been cured. For example, if we take about stage 1B patients that were included in this trial, half of them, they don't even relapse. So we are asking all patients to take three years of therapy, of this expensive therapy. Uh, the cost of osimertinib is somewhere between 15 to 20,000 US dollars a month. And we are asking uh, patients to take this drug for three years, 36 months. Uh, and it's not only about cost. We are asking patients to undertake a therapy for three years Although people say the toxicity is manageable and things like that, the toxicity is still there, grade one, grade two toxicities, and the toxicities are lasting for three years. So even if it's not grade four toxicity, it's grade two diarrhea for three years. That's, that's quite a big deal. And the most important point is, we don't know what the overall survival is going to be. And we don't know whether the patient was going to relapse or not in the first place. The patient probably would have been cured after surgery and chemo. So the patient may never need uh, um, the drug. And if the patient did relapse, osimertinib is already approved as a good first line agent when the disease relapses. So it's a good first line agent. Uh, so you have to compare overall survival with this approach versus uh, patients getting the control arm actually should be surgery and adjuvant chemo and then follow up until they relapse, and at the time of relapse, give them osimertinib, first line. 
So whether giving osimertinib upfront as adjuvant for three years improves overall survival versus this approach, that should have been the ideal comparison. So that is not uh, the case here. So we can't say even if there is this impressive hazard ratio for disease-free survival, we don't know whether it's going to improve overall survival or not. And unless we know that versus a standard control, we, uh, I don't think we can, uh, we can recommend this uh, therapy for, for every people who have undergone uh, resection uh, for non-small cell lung cancer. We should definitely continue to give them adjuvant chemo. That's, that's uh, my take away. Um, with regards to whether or not we should be giving adjuvant osimertinib, I would wait for the mature overall survival data to come. Uh, there have been a lot of examples in oncology, not only in lung cancer, where such disease-free survival, impressive hazard ratios in disease-free survival, did not translate to benefit in overall survival. Sometimes you can translate to harm in overall survival. We can, we have seen that. Um, um, say bevacizumab in colorectal cancer, uh, pretty good uh, disease-free survival uh, we saw early on, but then that translated to worse outcomes later. Um, so it's, it's still too early to recommend this. And then the other thing is about duration. Like with adjuvant therapy, you don't know how long you have to, uh, this trial tested for three years, but why you stop it three years then? You could, you could easily ask that question. If the disease is under control for three years, maybe we should give it five years. Maybe we should give it for 10 years, just like adjuvant hormone therapy in, in breast cancer. But are we really going to go down that line? Are we really going to recommend adjuvant treatments such as osimertinib for a number of years without even knowing whether it's going to help patients or not uh, in terms of improving overall survival? So that is uh, those ethical uh, economic issues uh, don't uh, give me the, the impetus to just say, oh, this is a wonderful trial and, and this should be practice ending. No, I, I'm not able to say that because of the reasons that, that I mentioned. Uh, and the other controversial trial, let's say, was uh, another plenary, uh, the Javelin Bladder 100 trial, um, which tested maintenance of Elumab after first-line chemotherapy for patients with urothelial cancer. Um, so again, why is this controversial? Uh, there is overall survival benefit. And usually when you see overall survival benefit, you don't say that it is controversial. But right now, despite seeing overall survival benefit, the reason I'm saying uh, this is controversial is because the control arm patients, uh, they only 43% uh, of them, they got checkpoint inhibitor later. So uh, this is just a question of, you know, uh, if they had received checkpoint inhibitor later when they relapsed, then they would have probably, they would have had same survival. And maybe that survival uh, difference uh, that we are seeing right now would have vanished. So again, it's a question of, should we give an expensive and toxic treatment upfront for all the patients when uh, you could give the same treatment when you need it, that is at the time of relapse, and you could maintain the same survival. And we don't know the answer to that question uh, because um, there was no crossover. And uh, we need to see results from a stratified analysis uh, based on patients who got checkpoint inhibitor later and what was the overall survival difference for those group of patients versus those patients who never got checkpoint inhibitor uh, in their life. Uh, so I think uh, that will help us to answer some, some, some of those concerns. Uh, and uh, the other interesting thing is in this uh, trial, if we look at the progression-free survival, the progression-free survival difference is quite, quite small. It's two versus 3.7 months. Uh, why is this important? Is that uh, if, we, if we look at the trial design, the patients, were, uh, patients got chemo, uh, platinum-based chemo, and then there was a, a four to 10 weeks period until which they could start the trial. So, that four to 10 weeks is in itself like two and two and a half months. Uh, and the progression free survival difference is two versus 3.7 months. So we should also know at what point, because four to 10 weeks is quite a long, long duration. We need to know at what point did patients start getting uh, avilumab versus the control arm patients. Like uh, if the patients on the treatment arm where he started down the line towards the 10 weeks point, but the patients in the control arm where he started uh, up the line towards the four weeks time, then that difference could be an artifact of just when we started the patients in treatment. Um, 
and the other plenary uh, that actually brought a lot of attention uh, is Keynote 177 trial for MSI high colorectal cancer patients, which showed an impressive progression free survival uh, difference of uh, it nearly prolonged the progression free survival by double 8.2 versus 16.5 months uh, with the use of pembrolizumab versus the chemotherapy arm. Um, and that was quite impressive. Uh, 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 the overall survival follow up is ongoing, but I was impressed with uh, the hazard ratio and uh, the toxicity profile of uh, pembrolizumab versus the chemotherapy. Uh, there was some uh, debate going on about why there was crossing over of the uh, PFS curves uh, towards the early uh, period. Uh, but I don't think that's, uh, mm, uh, that's very unusual for immunotherapy because we have seen such crossing over of PFS curves in lung cancer as well with immunotherapy. What that actually means is uh, the immunotherapy takes certain time to work and we might see some uh, pseudo progression as well. Uh, we need to see if that happens in colorectal cancer as well. Uh, if the OS curves cross early on, then we need to be careful about it. But crossing over of PFS curves is not a big deal. Uh, uh, so those were some of the uh, controversial plenaries uh, uh, from the ASCO 2020 meeting. Uh, but uh, with regards to other important trials, not plenary, but other important trials that were presented at ASCO 2020, uh, I was impressed with uh, the fact that ASCO gave platform to a number of negative trials this year. Um, including one in the plenary, uh, which was a trial of uh, breast cancer, uh, whether or not we should treat the primary tumor with a local therapy uh, when the patient presents with uh, stage four uh, disease. And actually, there ha this was already answered by a, a trial from India a couple of years ago that showed that uh, doing surgery for the primary tumor was not of any benefit uh, when the patient has stage four disease. And uh, the results were the same from this new trial that was presented uh, at ASCO 2020, but uh, nevertheless, it was good to have a confirmation um, of the finding. Um, uh, the other trials, uh, one trial that was uh, also published in New England Journal simultaneously was the trial of uh, GNRH antagonist, Relugolix uh, versus uh, Goserelin GNRH agonist for uh, prostate cancer patients, advanced prostate cancer patients. Uh, androgen deprivation therapy uh, has been one of the key progress against prost prostate cancer. Uh, but um, the problem with uh, GNRH agonist is the initial uh, testosterone flare that can aggravate the disease for a certain uh, initial duration. A GNRH antagonist like Degarelix, they don't have that side effect. So GNRH antagonists are a little more attractive, but for some reason, Degarelix has not gained uh, a lot of uh, uptake in practice uh, compared to GNRH agonist. Uh, and one reason is uh, the Degarelix is given by injection. It can be given monthly or three monthly. Uh, and there are some uh, injection reactions with uh, uh, the drug. So this new drug, Relugolix, is an oral form of GNRH antagonist. So, so it was pretty uh, exciting. And uh, the good news is that uh, it was tested as both non-inferiority and superiority trial in hierarchical design, and it met both the criteria. So that means Relugolix was superior to uh, GNRH agonist. Uh, so that was good news. And it also had very, uh, it also lowered the risk of cardiac side effects. Uh, so overall, it is good news. But again, as a global oncologist, if I have to put it into global perspective, then I think Relugolix is going to cost substantially uh, compared to Degarelix. Relugolix and Degarelix both are GNRH antagonists. And um, although Relugolix is oral and there was good compliance, I think from global oncology perspective, uh, Degarelix uh, should still be uh, the choice because there is no, no data to say Relugolix is better than Degarelix. Of course, both of them are and GNRH antagonist. And then you can give it once three months and, and uh, injection once three months should not be a big deal. Uh, and uh, you, there will be confirmed compliance with an injection uh, compared to oral medications, which should be uh, a big deal in low and middle income countries. Uh, so that's my take on that. There was uh, one uh, policy relevant uh, trial uh, presented, that is the trial of Tukatinib, or Tuklein trial, 
the trial of tricotinib in, in, in breast cancer, uh, how to positive breast cancer. Uh, the policy relevance that I'm excited about this trial is that they included patients with breast cancer who had brain metastasis. So usually in most of the trials, brain metastasis is an exclusion criteria. If a patient has brain metastasis, they cannot be a part of the trial. But in this trial, um, this trial showed uh, that patients with brain metastasis can very well be enrolled into a randomized control trial and can very well be a part of the trial. Uh, so uh, rather than the efficacy of tocatinib, which we can debate again, um, or its relevance to low-income countries, the relevance of this trial for me is that the take-home message from this trial for me is that we should not be excluding patients with brain metastasis from routine randomized control trials. Uh, and uh, a couple of uh, important trials were presented in hepatocellular cancer. Uh, a trial of uh, two new agents, donafenib in first line and apatinib in the second line. Uh, metastatic hepatocellular cancer. The good thing about these trials is that both of them came from China. Now we have to take a look at what their cost will be. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, they will cost less than what these new drugs like lambatinib cost uh, for hepatocellular cancer in the West. So that uh, was also of interest to me. Um, so, and uh, of course, I was also interested uh, to see some of the presentations related to uh, COVID-19 and cancer. Um, for me, uh, the question about whether or not patients with uh, cancer who are getting chemotherapy are at a higher risk of dying from COVID-19 complications compared to patients who don't have cancer or who are not getting chemotherapy for cancer, I think that that question has not yet been settled. We still need to continue with uh, uh, the efforts on, on collecting data that we have had um, special congratulations to my friend, um, a lot of friends whom I have at the COVID-19 and Cancer Consortium. Uh, and they have done a huge effort and uh, their, their publication in Lancet uh, was uh, the result of a huge collaboration. And we should be aiming for continuation of such collaborations. And not only for COVID-19, I think we should take this lesson and we should continue collaborations for rare cancers, uh, for example. Uh, so uh, there were a number of negative trials that were presented at ASCO 2020, and I think they are very relevant because negative trials tell us what not to do. One of them was the Keynote 61 trial of pembrolizumab uh, versus Paclitaxel as a second line treatment and, uh, in, in, in gastric cancer. Uh, and it showed that uh, there was no improvement in outcomes by using checkpoint uh, inhibitor pembrolizumab uh, versus a classic chemo, Paclitaxel, which costs much less than pembrolizumab and which we have been using for a long time. So newer is not always better. Newer is not necessarily better. Um, and um, the other theme was uh, just having a target does not mean uh, you can hit the target and improve outcomes. This we saw in uh, the RTOZ1010 trial in which we, uh, we tested the same hypothesis adding Herceptin to the cross regimen for esophageal cancer. And this did not improve disease-free survival or overall survival. Um, so the, the bottom line is uh, we need to keep testing the targets uh, in a randomized fashion because if we had not tested these trials in a randomized trial, then we would never know whether they were going to improve outcomes or not. Uh, so we need to keep testing in randomized trials, uh, but we should not be so excited and get ahead of ourselves that just having a target uh, would make us believe that we can improve outcomes by having a drug against it. And, and that should be a key take home message because we also saw trials for newer targeted agents like Vastizumab, uh, Diroxtican, uh, which was uh, uh, presented for a, for a number of tumor types, uh, like gastric cancer, for example. Uh, and these were just uh, phase two trials. Uh, and some of them were not even randomized trials. And still, we were getting pretty excited about, oh, this should be a game changer. This should be the uh, biggest new thing in, in this particular tumor type. We should not uh, get ahead of ourselves. We should continue to remember the lessons that we have learned over these years. And we need to continue to test them in a proper randomized controlled trial to make sure that they really improve outcomes or sometimes they can even worsen the outcomes and we need to save our patients from that. Uh, 
So that should be the take home for nearly all single arm trials that were presented um, this year at ISCO. And even with uh, phase two trials, uh, the response rate, uh, we have done a study that was published in the Journal of NCC in this January that the response rates from non-randomized trials actually is falsely exaggerated uh, and the duration of response particularly, not response rate, but duration of response. So uh, the durable responses that we see in non-randomized trials could actually shrink when you do a randomized trial, um, much less uh, about over survival. Uh, and the other negative trial that I want to uh, highlight is about uh, the trial of again adding uh, Herceptin for uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. Uh, this was the NSABP B43 trial of uh, radiotherapy plus or minus Herceptin for DCIS and again adding Herceptin did not improve outcomes. Uh, so this is another negative trial that actually informs uh, our clinical practice. Um, and then uh, I would like to uh, uh, talk about a couple of trials that uh, a couple of trials from geriatric oncology that uh, uh, shows us that not every practice changing trial is a new drug trial uh, you could make a lot of difference uh, by doing some simple interventions there was an rct of doing a geriatric assessment uh, uh, for elderly patients and just doing a geriatric assessment decreased uh, the incidence of grade three to five toxicities uh, which is which was a pretty uh, nice uh, observation, uh, and I like that trial. Uh, I also like the trial of uh, um, I think it was called the Panda trial for uh, colorectal cancer patients over the age of seventy, stratified on the basis of uh, G8 uh, geriatric uh, screening score and uh, tested whether or not we could omit uh, oxaliplatin from Folfox plus uh, pantomab regimen for these elderly patients and uh, I, I think they did not make a statistical comparison but uh, the median overall survival was pretty much similar uh, for patients who did not get oxaliplatin versus those who got oxaliplatin uh, based on this geriatric screening so those were some some good uh, informative trials uh, I, I think I had never seen so much globally relevant trials uh, presented at ASCO most of my colleagues working in low and income countries uh, they used to tell me that coming to ASCO was like an expensive trip to Chicago. Uh, they would, uh, and you know, the, the actual relevance to the clinical practice would be very small. Uh, it was ni nice for sightseeing and networking and everything, but uh, most of the trials uh, that were presented at ASCO were about these new drugs that they never would have access to anyway. Uh, so there was very low value in that. Uh, and actually, I think uh, uh, one of my colleagues from India I think it was uh, Dr. Nirmal Raut uh, who just posted on Twitter, I saw it a couple of hours ago, saying something like going to ASCO is like, you know, going to a uh, brand, fashion brand store. You go inside, you try to, uh, you, you get attracted by looking at a number of things, but then you return without buying anything to take home. Uh, so for global oncology colleagues, it has, that, that perfectly summarizes how how we feel about ASCO, right? Um, you you hear about all oh, this new PARP inhibitor, this you know FTFR inhibitor, and things like that. You go back home, and there is nothing to use there. Um, but but actually, at this ASCO, there was a lot uh, for global oncology colleagues to take home, uh, and a number of those trials came from low income countries itself. Uh, and I was very, very happy with that. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one was the relevance of the same breast cancer surgery trial, local therapy trial that I previously discussed from the plenary session. Uh, that is relevant globally. Now we know that there is no point in offering surgery uh, to patients with uh, breast cancer that have presented at stage four. Uh, and the second one was uh, a head and neck cancer trial that came from uh, Tata Memorial Cancer Center in India. Uh, which showed uh, that uh, the use of uh, metronomic chemotherapy uh, was non inferior to the use of uh, IV uh, chemo. So that, that should be practice changing, uh, in my opinion. Uh, and especially the burden of head and neck cancer is more in low income countries anyway. Uh, so they have nicely shown that uh, we could use metronomic chemotherapy uh, uh, plus uh, celecoxib. Um, and it was uh, non-inferior to using uh, injection uh, 
and platinum. And uh, with regards to RNA cancer, there was one more study that came from Japan, uh, the JCOL group, uh, where they looked at weekly versus three weekly cisplatin uh, in combination with radiotherapy for locally advanced RNA squamous cell, cell carcinoma. And again, there was uh, uh, they could prove non inferiority, so we could give a lower dose weekly and preserve quality of life, lower toxicities. Uh, so these are the type of you know de-escalation practice changing trials that I'm actually a big fan of um, because this translates to clinic tomorrow all over the world uh, and this is about preserving efficacy and protecting patients quality of life um, and uh, the other one was again a surgery trial about inherent cancer about the role of uh, uh, prophylactic uh, uh, sentinel lymph node dissection in oropharyngeal cancers. Uh, um, again, this reiterated the findings from Tata Memorial Center a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, there was one uh, nice uh, poster about uh, adding a PPI omeprazole to patients with triple negative breast cancer which uh, seem to have a good pathological complete response rate. Again, omeprazole is a relatively cheaper drug. I'd like to see a bigger RCT of this uh, to confirm the findings. Yeah, one, one other um, impressive result that I wanted to share was uh, the long-term follow-up results from three years versus one year of imatinib for uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumors. Impressive hazard ratio 0 0.55. Uh, so these are the uh, type of... Uh, uh, trials that actually um, make a difference. Uh, so I guess uh, the bottom line of the take home message from ASCO 2020 has been that uh, it is becoming more globally relevant than before. And I think ASCO should continue this trend. And I would encourage ASCO to actually, you know, invite discussions from low and income countries to discuss these trials that are of global importance. Um, and it was very easy to do so at this time because it was virtual anyway. Um, so I think we should continue to improve on, on, on that direction. That is one feedback for ASCO on how to improve things in future. Um, they are doing quite a good job. I, I appreciate that. Uh, I want to see continued efforts to make it more and more globally uh, relevant uh, conference. And uh, the other take home message for us clinicians is that um, new way is not always better. We should always be careful of that. Just having a target and a drop to hit that target does not necessarily mean it is going to improve outcomes. There are a number of interventions, including de-escalation of therapy that can improve patient outcomes and are not necessarily related to new drugs. And five, especially when we are talking about maintenance therapy or adjuvant therapy, where we want to treat 100% of the patients uh, with a drug indefinitely or for a number of years, we, I think it's minimum to ask for overall survival gains without knowing that the drug is going to improve our overall survival, especially in adjuvant and maintenance therapy setting. We cannot settle for anything less uh, because that is exposing 100% of patients to a drug without knowing that uh, you know, some of them might never need the drug and some of them who do need the drug up and relapse may do equally well by getting the drug up and relapse. So we need to make sure that we improve overall survival especially in those two settings. So those are my key take-home messages from this ASCO.